That's good. Entity. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. I'm ready to go. Thanks. Okay, let's get started. So, um, I hope everything's okay. Um, I just wanted to quickly uh, look again at the course outline just to figure out what's going on and where we're um, standing at the moment. So this is February 14th. We're doing sinusoidal models. And this is part of our, our first um, block of lectures, which is about sound synthesis. So last week we were talking about analog synthesis, and then next week we'll be talking about LPC. These are all different algorithms for generating sound using signal processing, which have different uh, areas of application and strengths and weaknesses. And then we'll be moving on to more um, effects, time domain effects, and some time and pitch modification, which draws on, on pitch scaling, pitch tracking, rather. And then we'll be looking, and then the final part of the course, we'll be looking more at kind of high level analysis and pulling stuff out of, out of the uh, music audio like that. So that's where we are, and so we're going to be talking about science and models. Um, and let's see, the, uh, the mini project is due this Wednesday, right? I hope you're all getting on okay with that. And then we'll assign a, another mini project um, soon, maybe next week. I think probably tr try and get it done by spring break, which is here. That's, that's the goal, yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't just give me the code. Um, yeah, I want a I wanna brief report describing what you did. So, um, you know, a uh, short PDF file saying, saying just um, what, what your, uh, what, you know, what, what, what you encountered and what you tried and what, what your results were and what you, know, what you saw about it. Okay. And then hopefully, you know, um, if someone wants to talk about that as make a presentation about what they did so we can have some kind of debrief on what, people, what people's experiences of those projects were, that would be great too. Okay, any other, any questions before we get going? Okay. Um, one thing, so I had, I had some discussion with the, uh, with the CVN students over the weekend because I was trying to, you know, see how it's working for the students who had taken the class remotely. And one thing that did come up was this idea that um, one way to get more out of the practicals would be to have some uh, examples that come up afterwards. So on Wednesday, we do this thing where we look at, you know, we have some questions and we try and modify some code, and it's like, it's hard to get very far in a short time. But then it's sort of, then we kind of drop it and it, it disappears. Um, but it, some of those students expressed interest in seeing examples of how some of these problems might have been solved afterwards. And I think this came up in class as well a few weeks ago. So um, I haven't been able to do that yet, simply I, haven't, I don't have model answers for those things. I mean, they're kind of, you know, they're, they're mostly open-ended. But, um, and I haven't had time to, to do any, but I'll try and do some from, from going forward so that we'll actually have, you know, if we have some, prop, some puzzle, then uh, I, have, I do have an idea of how these things should be done. And so you can have a look at that. Uh, but I'll, I'll sort of release those after, after the practical. Any other suggestions? 
of things that you know that <coughs> just occur to you that might be interesting or might be worth doing, please do send me email. I'm very interested in in uh, ideas on how to improve things. Okay. So. Um, Science title modeling. We've sort of, you know, we've spoken about um, sinusoids as the basis, well, for Fourier analysis anyway, and also as these kind of, uh, of having a profound relation to our perception of sound too, because um, when you look at what happens in the cochlea, you know, the, the simplest way to understand the Active, the activation, the motion of the cochlea is uh, in terms of individual regions of the ear, the inner ear being excited by individual sinusoid components, Fourier components of the, of the audio. So, um, and then when we see a spectrogram, we see these horizontal ridges if we do a narrowband spectrogram, and those are the individual sinusoidal Fourier components. So uh, this is about um, this topic is about actually literally representing sound as a set of sinusoids. So, this is not very clear, but if we, um, let's see if I can, there we go. Um, you know, this is the output of the spectrogram for the violin, violin note. And what we see is a set of these horizontal stripes. Now these are, you know, we know what the spectrogram is. Each cell is just the, you know, the evaluation of a particular sinusoidal basis function over a particular time window. But, and so it's, they're not, these are not discrete lines. These are just ridges, areas of energy in the spectrogram. But they clearly are well described by discrete lines, they, we get a pretty good representation if we just took individual sinusoids at each of those frequencies and added them together. Which um, seems like a tempting idea. I mean, that would be nice rather than, rather than representing the sound as this sort of waveform here where all the components are sort of superimposed. We could, we could describe each of these components individually and then that might be something that would be powerful and uh, useful for manipulating the sound. So, um, of course, this is really just the Fourier series that we're taking a, 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 a waveform, a time domain waveform, and representing it as a sum of sinusoids with particular amplitudes. But here, we're allowing the, uh, we've got a discrete set of K sinusoids here. K is indexing our set of sinusoids. But we're allowing the amplitudes to vary with time, because obviously they're not completely stationary. And we're allowing the, the frequencies to vary with time. So 5K is the time varying phase, which in a normal sinusoid would just be omega, omega n or something like that, some constant phase advance per unit time. But we're making it a function, we can have some variation with time. But the idea is that both of both these amplitudes and this phase phase derivative frequency will will vary relatively slowly. So here's we can think of this phase as that if it were just omega, if it were just omega times n that would be a normal Fourier component. K times omega times n is um, if k is an integer and assume these are the integers here, that's an integer multiple of some fundamental omega zero. So it's the, reg it's the you know, exact, a perfectly harmonic Fourier series. But by making omega zero be a function of n, we've now got a time varying fundamental that, and we can have a set of components whose frequencies are harmonics of a time varying fundamental. It's actually so that we've got the assumption of harmonicity implicit in this. But we also, I mean, in theory, we could have any function here. You know, we could have A, a and K and omega zero uh, vary dramatically from sample to sample. Um, but that wouldn't work. I mean, they wouldn't, they w the, the result wouldn't necessarily give us what we're expecting. 
So we assume that there's uh, the a, a of k, a sub k of n, and omega 0 of n are smoothly, uh, slowly varying. So that if we look over a narrow window, we can sort of assume that they're constant, locally constant. And so then when we do a Fourier analysis on a local window, a short-time Fourier transform, what we get out is kind of what we expect, a set of harmonic peaks at multiples of some locally constant frequency omega 0 with magnitudes that reflect the strength of the individual harmonics, the AK, at that time. If we had omega zeros that changed, omega zeros that changed rapidly within the length of one short-time Fourier transform window, then when we, when we analyze the whole window, we wouldn't see a single frequency peak, right? We'd see energy spread around depending on how omega zero, zero had varied. And it's also true for AK that if AK, you know, we know that if you take a sinusoid and you modulate it by another sinusoid, you get side loads, right? You get the, um, the AM components at plus and minus the, the uh, carrier plus and minus the modulation frequency. So AK has to, any, any time varying components in here actually end up spreading the um, harmonic because they're like the, the omega and the modulation components. So these have to be low enough frequency so they don't significantly spread the, uh, the analysis of that harmonic within the window. But if these are you know, slow, changing on the order of tens of milliseconds for a f short time for a transform that maybe has a window length of tens of milliseconds, then we, then we do meet our model of having them be locally constant. And it's still rapid enough to give us an interesting model of sound, a sound that varies in a natural way. Because of these limitations, that because of these arbitrary limitations and because we can, of course, add a, a large number of sinusoids, uh, this is basically, a mo you, can, you, you can model any sound like this. We already know that if we just take these as, you know, the fixed Fourier basis over some window and we include all of the Fourier terms, then we can model an arbitrary sound with the Fourier terms. But, um, you know, even with the assumption that we've got some omega zero, you know, we've got, a, we've got a lot of free parameters here, so we can match any sound if we want to. The trick is finding the set that isn't too large but still matches the sound pretty closely. Yeah? Uh, is, it, uh, is it possible for the two subcarriers to overlap? Is it possible for the two subcarriers to overlap? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, then, then come to the uh, channel, then come to the frequency selected channel yeah. to divide it. So uh, that is, uh, it is possible for the two subcarriers of the, um, yeah. the waveforms to yeah. be overlapped yeah. or have to be, um, have to be separated yeah. by the specific frequency. So, it, uh, there's no simple answer to that, right? Um, the way we've structured it here, if we, if we structure it so that the summation here is, is over sinusoids who are all harmonics, then obviously their frequency tracks aren't going to, their center frequencies aren't going to overlap. We're sort of forcing them to be uniformly spaced by omega zero the whole time. But if we have rapid modulation, then it could be that their bandwidth, if we took each one of these sinusoids individually, and calculated its spectrum, that those spectra, the edges of the spectrum would, spectra would overlap. Of course, more generally, we don't actually have to have this constraint. We could just have a set of sinusoids where the frequencies and the magnitudes are completely independent, and then we can do whatever we want with them. The question is how we would analyze a real sound to generate, to result in sinusoids that, that crossed, but you could, you could imagine situations that do that. So yeah, there's nothing, there's nothing intrinsic to this that forces the sinusoids to have separate spectral support, essentially. But, you know, it's, uh, this, this whole thing is a little bit hand wavy, right? That we're sort of, we're, 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 we're confounding two things. The idea of a uh, Fourier analysis, which is when you've got stationary sinusoids, sinusoids of constant frequency, and then the idea of this tracking a real sound where we've got time varying sinusoids. And, you know, once you allow omega, omega zero to be non-constant, then it's not really, you can't really use your science, you, you can't use your Fourier analysis in the way that we're using it. But, you know, as long as we don't get too far from local sta stationarity, then we're okay. 
sorry, that's not a more uh, rigorous answer. Okay, so um, it turns out there are a bunch of um, software tools we can use for doing this kind of analysis. And so there's this very nice one written by this guy, Michael Klingbeil, who was actually a student here um, for a while, a few years ago, in the music department, I think. And it's this, um, it's this piece of software, and it runs on different platforms. And uh, what you can do, let me just start, oops, start from scratch here, is uh, you can open a, a waveform, a sound file, And uh, it, then it brings up this dialogue here, which gives you the option to, to, uh, to choose different for analysis components. Basically, you're having to choose the... It's going gonna, it's gonna to take a spectrogram and then find a set of tiny size to fit the spectrogram. And here you're choosing the, 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 the frequency resolution of the spectrogram. Right, so here... Do you mean the frequency resolution is a fundamental frequency of the sinusoid? No. I mean... Um, Basically, the this is the the the, the window size, right? The the length of the, si the the time window, which is because you because of the duality between time and frequency, the shorter window means a broader blurring on the frequency axis. So it's like the minimum spacing between ha harmonics that you could resolve, which is the most useful way of thinking about it here. So I think actually the default is longer than this, like 60 hertz, something like that. Let's just try that. And now, as you see, it's gone to a 3,000 point window and an 8,000 point FFT to try and get that. <coughs> but you can, we'll, we'll, we'll see the effects here. And lo and behold, here is um, our sound. So this sound um, <coughs> is this, the sound of the high E string being plucked on a guitar. And um, I guess we can look at this in MATLAB. Um, sorry. Okay, so here's it. Here's the spectrogram. That's interesting. Um, I'll just fix the uh, color map to hide the noise floor here. Okay, so it's a, you know, it looks like one of these plucked sounds that we have. It's got a lot of harmonics, and they die away, and the high ones die away faster. But when we load it into Sphere, it, um, it actually does this thing of extra each of these harmonics has now been modeled by one of these lines. I'm just zooming out the frequency axis here. But what we're plotting is now the parameters of the individual sinusoids that Spear has used to model this. Now, if I play this, we get pretty much the same sound, certainly the same pitch. But what we can do is, we're in Spear is we can select individual harmonics here, and then by using Shift Space, I can play just the selected harmonics. So that's kind of interesting sound. That's the fundamental of the um, guitar note. So it's basically a sinusoid, but it has this envelope on it. And so it sort of it has this funny kind of sinusoidal sound with this sort of popping beginning. But then it also has, but you can hear this quite a lot. It doesn't sound like a stationary sinusoid because it's got this amplitude modulation, which is read from the spectrogram. If we look at the spectrogram here, you can see this fundamental actually has some fairly deep modulation in here. And so we can hear that, and that's basically the beating of the E with the low E strings, harmonics, something like that. We can add in harmonics here. So, uh, um, and so, as you can see, well, it's interesting, it's picking up those. If we're picking up some of the uh, weaker, weaker harmonics, which are not based on the pitch. 
But as I add them all in, the sound becomes more and more recognizable as the guitar note. And actually what's happening is we're basically getting low-passed versions of the guitar note, right? We're, we're preserving most of the energy up to a certain frequency. If I select them all, that is the sound we started with. One thing, so if I select them all, you see there are a lot here, and in particular, around the beginnings of the sound, and actually over here at the end, it has a lot of tracks because it's, at some level it's picking up the background noise and treating that as like, well, there are some sort of, you know, there are a few peaks in the energy here. Um, I can model those with sinusoids as well. But you can um, select all the harmonics. Oops. You can select all the harmonics, for instance, below some threshold here. And then I can simply delete those. And now I have a much simpler representation of the sound with just a few harmonics, but it still sounds pretty much the same. Yeah. So, so how does this how does this relate to, to compression? You mean like data compression, using a more compact way to describe the signal? So, if we had a if so, that's a good question. That um, particularly for a musical sound like this, it's actually quite well described as a set of a set of sinusoids and the frequencies and the amplitudes of sinusoids. And you know, if we have a lot of sinusoids, then we need a lot of data to to describe them. But if we can efficiently represent it, and here, I mean, we've got something like 30 or 40 sinusoids. And then we're, we're representing each one by a, a frequency and a magnitude every few milliseconds. So we're, we're only talking about, you know, maybe, um, maybe 10,000 parameters a second. Okay. So now it becomes, well, that, that be, that's beginning to approach the data rate of a of sample signal, which is 44,000 values a second, right? But if we're careful and if we don't, you know, if, if, we're, if we've got a fairly discrete spectrum, which is well described by a few sinusoids, we could, in theory, represent it in a, in a compressed format by just having the parametric, the parameters of the sinusoids be the representation. So there are some systems that try and do that, and um, they work very well. They work best for harmonically related sounds, because then you don't actually store the frequencies of every sinusoid. You just so the frequency is fundamental, and say the others are multiples of that. Um, but they're they're you know they're pretty computationally expensive to reconstruct. It's not that easy to get the analysis so that to find the optimal analysis, and uh, it's it turns out to be perhaps too flexible. That actually it gives you the opportunity to describe more of the sound than you care about because you know I'm, I'm using. I'm using, um, you know, a sinusoidal track to store this energy up here at 9,000 hertz. Now, if I listen to this on its own, can you hear that? Sounds like a little... Yeah. <laughs> it's not out of your hearing range, it's just too quiet. But it sounds like a little glass being ting. It's just this very, very high-frequency sinusoid. You don't, you know, if, so if I now, if I play the whole thing... And I play it without these, freak, these sinusoids up here. It doesn't really sound that much different, right? Um, so we, we're, we're using perhaps too much detail. We're storing perhaps too much detail. So it's not, it's not the most, it's not the greatest approach for, for compression, but it definitely is a, a basis and it's used sometimes. So, um, okay, so that's the, the general idea. And so actually, um, I wonder what these things are down here, right? These little extra bits of energy but that are away from the harmonics. If we play those on their own. I don't know if you can hear that. This, this bottom one is some kind of squeak. It's the long, strongest one. Oh, no, it's too, it's too low. So the one we're hearing that, it's just some, you know, it's some... Uh, uh, 
damped mode from a different string or something that just happens to be picked up as a sinusoid. So again, they're not really uh, contributing to the sound of the, the instrument. Okay, let's just, so that's the, the idea of what we're trying to do, of what we're, what we're talking about. Let's just keep talking about what happens here and then we'll see the other things we can work with. So here's um, actually the fundamental from that guitar note. Right? So here it is, you can see it's got this, this modulation which gave us that interesting sound. And here's the actual values. You can't quite see, but there are individual dots here, so it's like little circles um, that, that we're using to resynthesize that. You can sort of see, these are the points that come out, but you can see there are some, it's basically interpolating between a, few, between a, sm a smaller number of, of, uh, of samples. But in order to get the frequency analysis that you want, the frequency resolution that you want, he's using a fairly long time window. And so even though, you know, basically the guitar really does start from there's no sound and suddenly it starts at some particular time, because there's a sort of analysis window, it begins to see the energy from that onset um, quite early on. Right? So I think these... Uh, I'm not sure what the units are here. There may be a few milliseconds. So up to like, you know, maybe, maybe 100 milliseconds early, it's beginning to see the pickup of this energy. Whereas maybe the real model is more like this, that the, there's zero energy for this, for this harmonic. And then suddenly it starts oscillating and you have the energy jump up like this. But the problem is you, it'd be very difficult to get this kind of result from a, from a spectrogram because you'd never really be able to see what happened here. In fact, if we resynthesize these... This is, this is, I took this, which came out of Spear. I then use it as the amplitude modulator to a sinusoid, and then I re put that back into the spectrogram and get this out, and you see it's this kind of nice uh, band-limited signal with this amplitude modulation. But if I do the same thing for here, what I get is this click at the beginning. It actually, it's, it, uh, it's br the rapid change in amplitude gives rise to a... Uh, a broad frequency component, which is sort of you know violating the assumptions of how we got it out of the spectrogram. Let's just listen to those. This is the original fundamental, or the the, the unmodified the synthesis of the unmodified parameters, or not. Oh yeah. Which we heard before, and then this is with the uh, with the rapid attack. So I don't know how well you can hear that, but it's it's more it's, it's got more more pop when you don't don't take off that that um, starting window. So actually, we can hear that in Spear. So that was that's the original uh, analysis that we had. If I if I open that sound file again, but now I use a wider frequency band, which means I'm using a shorter time window, which means I'm, my blurring, right, the, the length of the time window is smaller. Um, you know, I get something that looks somewhat similar if I put it on the same axis here, um, although it's not identical. Well, it's not identical because the axes aren't the same, but, but the, the sort of Basically, what's happening? You know, this first um, little bit, there is this tr this effect that the 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 transient sort of fades into these harmonics, and that happens slightly differently here. But if I listen to this, compare it to this one, I think you can hear that the second one, this one with the shorter analysis window, has a, a more crisp attack, right? You can really hear the pluck. Whereas this one, which had the longer analysis window, if you listen to that initial pluck, I don't know. These kinds of sound examples are always very difficult because, like, firstly, I know what I'm supposed to hear, so I hear it. 
And secondly, we're listening to it over speakers in a room with background noise and reverberation. So there's a lot of things. But you can, um, you can get this program, download it free on the, on the web, and you can try it out yourself. And so the thing to do is to ch vary that um, initial frequency analysis parameter and listen to the differences. Yeah. Does the kind of the vector tracing work with larger sound samples that are just one note? Yes. So actually, um, this, uh, the, that particular note is pulled out of this longer waveform here. Let's just try this on the whole thing. So I was able to use a, a fairly broad frequency resolution of 160 hertz because I'm looking at a high note. Yeah, look at this. No, this is all, no let's see what this is. Um, but if, I, if, I, if my pitch had been lower, then the harmonics would have been closer together and it wouldn't have worked. So this is the uh, original sound file, which is all the strings on the guitar played in sequence. But now the harmonics are too close together for the lowest strings. That's the string we heard. And then, I, then it's a chord. Yeah. So you can, uh, you, you, you can do whatever you want with this. That was quite interesting that what happened there in the lowest note, you know, the harmonics are now too close together, and so it's doing something very strange with this. Um, <laughs> it sounds more like a, you know, a double bass or something um, because it's, you know, it, it, is a, it is able to more or less reproduce the sound by putting together a lot of these harmonics and that kind of interference, but, but it's clearly not a, not, a, not a very simple or effect, you know, uh, efficient representation. But if we try that with a longer window, so if I go back to like 60 hertz resolution here, Sorry? Well, the, wind, the window is always a time window, but here, for, because, of, because you're normally thinking about its impact on the frequency axis, the program allows you to specify it in terms of the effective frequency resolution. I'm not exactly sure what, you know, how he defines the frequency resolution, but basically that number is such that if that's uh, below your, the lowest pitch that you want to res uh, record, then you're okay. So now you can see this, this uh, this note down here, this first low E, is now nicely represented with a set of individual harmonics. And the final chord of course when we have a chord, we have multiple notes sounding, we've basically got the superposition of all their Fourier analyses, um, but it means that on now the chances of two harmonics, you know, the, the resolution the number we start with, the number, you know, the 60 hertz, 160 hertz, is the, s is the spacing between two harmonics that can, the smallest spacing that can be resolved. So if we have two notes playing at once, now it's like, well, the harmonics going to be wherever they are, and the chances are they're going to be, some of them are going to be too close to resolve. And the, the worse your frequency resolution, the more often you're going to get multiple harmonics. What happens with the sinusoidal model then is in the spectrogram you get this kind of beating pattern and then the science of the model will try and track that beating pattern. So now with a finer fr frequency resolution, we can see these individual sinusoids in the chord, but it's very tempting to sort of say, well, can we now pick out these individual notes in this chord, which um, is only possible to a limited degree. So that's... Oh, wait. I'm trying to identify the harmonics of a particular note here. <laughs> you can sort of do something, but, that, but it, there, it's not, these, the notes are no longer completely distinct, at least in this um, representation. Okay, so let's, um, that gives you the idea of what we're trying to do and uh, shows you that, you know, it can have some kind of interesting 
results, at least for analyzing real sounds. Let's just look a little more uh, technically at how it works and how we actually, you know, what's going on inside Spear to make this stuff work. So the basic idea is we, you know, the intuition is we're going to make a spectrogram, we're going to find these ridges in the spectrogram, and those are going to be the parameters for the sinusoids that we're going to try and uh, pull out to resynthesize. So we start off with uh, the short time Fourier transform, which is just the, the DFT of the signal windowed into frames, which we looked at before. So we have this STFT, which is a function of a uh, frequency bin K and a time hop index M, which is just the signal centered on the mth hop of L samples here, and then multiplied by short time window W of N, or W of N, yeah, W of N, say, so that this is, this is always in some range of, from N equals zero to however long the window is, but we shift X back to make sure the relevant part of X lies under the window. And then we just have the DFT, which is just here, and where we've got the window length here in the DFT. And we saw before that what you know, compared to just taking the Fourier transform of X alone, because we've got the product of X and W, the Fourier transform we get is the convolution in the frequency domain of the, you know, the, the ideal spectrum of X and the spectrum of the window, which at the window is normally the sort of smooth thing in time, which is a low-pass filter, smoothing filter in time. And so it normally has this kind of nice little bump in frequency, which is basically a blurring of the frequency axis. And if, if, the, if X consists of a set of discrete harmonics, you know, or approximately, and then we're blurring it with some, you know, bump in the frequency axis, then we've got to make sure that the bump is not so broad that we're going to start having these adjacent harmonics overlapping. If we do, we'll still get something out, but we won't get the, the separation of the individual harmonics into different components, which is what we want to achieve. So what that means is the, the, window, has to, the window has to be long enough in time so that it's narrow enough in frequency so that you can resolve the individual harmonics. And actually, it sort of makes sense that if the window is so short that you can't see an entire pitch cycle, then in a sense, there's no way that the analysis could know that it's made of harmonics. If I have this thing, which is you know, an impulse, every 10 milliseconds, and I look at a 2 millisecond segment of that and take its Fourier transform. Well, in 2 millisecond segment, there's no evidence that this pulse is going to repeat in 10 milliseconds. So naturally, there's no way you can have those harmonics. It's only if you have a window which encompasses at least you know, one complete cycle or a few whole cycles of signal that you're going to be able to, that has any hope of getting the harmonics out. And that is the same thing as saying, well, if I have a, a signal with a 10 millisecond period and I use a 20 or 30 millisecond window, then that means in the frequency axis my, my blurring is going to be small enough that I can see the individual harmonics of this 100 hertz signal coming out. So, um, and the, obviously the longer you go, the less blurring you have in frequency, and so the better your resolution, but the more blurring you have in time. So typically, um, for music, signals, we use a window in the range of 50 to 100 milliseconds, which gives us enough frequency resolution to get the low pitches that we want without blurring the onsets and the dynamics too much to, 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 to spoil the information. The hop between successive windows, again, it's the same, as it, same situation as we had in the spectrogram. Um, N over 2 is very common, so that if you're using uh, raised cosine windows, hand windows, then they sort of overlap at their 50% points. So you have every, you know, every chunk of, every moment in time has some window with some significant support. If you use a higher, uh, a smaller overlap, a smaller advance, so you have a greater degree of overlap. It's like if you use a, an advance of n over four, then every point in time axis is represented in four successive windows. This just gives you a way to interpolate the parameters, like the magnitude parameters, because now, rather than having two points 10 milliseconds apart and having to join them with a straight line, now you've only got two points 5 milliseconds apart, so there are you know, fewer straight lines. You're not really getting any more information, but you, you're, you're letting, the, uh, FF, letting the STFT do your interpolation for you.
and that can be that can be important in in giving good quality in the resynthesis. So we've got this uh, basic short time Fourier transform spectrogram that we're and it's and it's of a periodic signal. So we see these nice ridges, but now as you see, it's zoomed in a little bit. So they're not you know they're not like single bins that are high. There are always adjacent bins, there are peaks. In fact, if we take a slice through it at a particular time and just plot the single spectrum, we get something that looks like this. So here we've got the level in dB versus the frequency in hertz. And again, you can see the individual points of the, of the, uh, coming, out of the F, coming out of the DFT here. And so you can see there's a clear harmonic here, but it's, you know, there are one, two, three, four, five, six points defining that peak, right? It's not just a single bin. Now, what we could do is just take the largest bin, you know, take the, the local peak peaks. But even with a relatively long window, um, like we were using in, in Spear, that's still only, what that's saying is the bins are like 60 hertz apart. So if I just took the single highest bin, I'd be quantizing the frequency I'm using to a 60 hertz grid, which is, you know, pretty bad, for, especially for low frequencies, like, you know, 60 hertz for a middle C would be, you know, a couple of semitones, something like that. So instead, we try to interpolate to get a, a more high-resolution estimate of the actual frequency. And so basically, you can you know, do whatever you like. This is showing the idea of fitting a, a, a parabola to the, to the point. So you take the three largest points, and you can fit a, you know, a parabola, a, a second-order function to these. And then you can say, well, if, this was, if, this, if they really were a parabola, then this would be the actual local maximum of the parabola which gives you an interpolated frequency axis. What you really want to do is take the, you know, w fit the actual model of what happened to the signal. If you say, if I assume this is a sinusoid, and then it was multiplied by time, if I assume it was a constant frequency sinusoid, multiplied by time window, then I expect this, re this realization in the DFT to be the, the shape, the Fourier transform of the time window shifted by that exact frequency. And so you can try and fit whatever you think the shape of that time window should be to, uh, to the points. If you use a Gaussian time window, e to the minus t minus t0 squared, then it turns out that that signal has a Fourier transform, which is also a Gaussian, e to the minus, you know, omega minus omega 0 squared, which then in the log domain becomes a parabola like this. So actually, if you use a a Gaussian time window, then this parabola fitting becomes the, the uh, theoretically correct thing to do. The problem with a Gaussian window is that it's not finite length. The, the Gaussian never goes to zero, so you actually have to use a pretty long window to, to avoid artifacts. But um, it, it can be quite nice. It, it does at least have low, re relatively few side lobes. Yeah. 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 The, the differences are not that great. Um, one of the things you have to worry about with this kind of peak picking on the, on the spectrogram is that if you have side lobes, they can show up as, uh, as peaks, right? And so uh, the Hamming window, which is the one with a little bit of extra offset added to pull down the first side lobes, that has side lobes which, which stay relatively, stay at the same amplitude for, 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 uh, in a wide frequency range. And that can be quite bad because now you may have a strong harmonic down here and nothing up here, and suddenly the side lobes of this thing are going to show up and start getting tracked. So it's better to use something like a hand window where the side lobes do die away consistency with, consistently with frequency. Or, you know, a window with even lower side lobes like a, a Blackman or something, you know, all these different ones. Or a Gaussian, for instance. But for a dense signal like this, you know, if the side lobes are more than 20 or 40 dB down, they're never going to make that much difference. They're never going to really show up. So it's not, it's not that critical. So you can interpolate the frequency like this. Of course, that also gives you an estimate of the interpolated peak <coughs> magnitude, because we're going to need to store the magnitude. And you may even want to interpolate the phase. Um, the way we sort of the way we were constructing this, we were not worrying about the phase, the actual phase of these sinusoids. We were just estimating their frequency and assuming if we integrate the frequency to get the phase, everything works out. But if you want to have a signal where you can actually compare it or somehow combine it directly with the original time domain, then you may want to make sure it stays in the, in the correct phase alignment too. 
So you may want to resynthesize to match the phase, and then you can do the interpolation of the phase for that sinusoid too, based on the, the phase function there. Um, so which sinusoids are we going to keep? Well, we've got this sort of spectrum here, and basically we're interested in the locally prominent sinusoids. And so you can do something like having a, a sort of smooth spectrum or a, a moving average of the spectrum, having some threshold above that, and then keeping all the peaks that are, that are above some, some local threshold. You could have a fixed threshold, but because sounds often have a fairly dramatic difference in the energy in the low frequency and the high frequency, that would mean you'd end up sort of storing too much detail in low frequency and losing all the high frequency. So having this kind of low frequency local threshold allows you to adaptively um, cut out the energy that's sort of dominated by local peaks while still being able to keep some, some detail in regions of low energy. This is on one frame, but of course even a noise signal will have local peaks, even though they're not really sinusoids. They, there's not, there's not, you can represent them as individual, you know, very short duration Fourier components, but they're not really what we're looking for. So sometimes we, we're, we're not going to keep one of these peaks unless it persists over time, um, which you can look at by looking at adjacent successive time frames. So um, once you've got the individual set of peaks from a single frame, then uh, most of these systems work by sort of having this first stage of peak picking, then you look at the next frame and do a set of peaks, and then you sort of do this correspondence task where you take the set of peaks in one frame and figure out the set of peaks in the next frame that they should be connected to. Um, you know, in the simplest case, they'll be at the same frequencies, but you have to accommodate the situation where the frequencies may shift slightly, and then you hope that you've got a short enough time window such that the, a real modulated sinusoid has moved only a small amount, so you can figure out which, which of the previous peaks it, begins, it belongs to. When you're doing this through time, you have to have the beginnings and ends of tracks. And so if you have a situation where there's a, a track, but when you do the analysis for the next frame, somehow the, the amplitude here doesn't make it above your threshold, so you get no peak then that becomes the end of a track. And then, by the same token, if you have a peak here that doesn't have anything that you can connect to, then that becomes the beginning of a new track. And you end up with these uh, discrete tracks, which is what we're seeing, again, you know, tracks with begins, beginnings and ends, which is what we're seeing coming out of sphere. A situation like this, where you have a track that sort of disappears and then something that reappears in the same frequency window, if you've got a fixed threshold, that's kind of what's going to happen, right? There'll be these... These, uh, um, there'll be these peaks which are just below the threshold. And maybe in the previous frame it was above threshold and we had a peak. And the next frame is going to do the same thing. So sometimes you'll use a, a hysteresis technique where once a, once a track's been created, you lower the threshold in that region so that um, you know, it's going to have to drop by a significant amount before you give up on that track again. Right, so you're basically locally changing the threshold for whether to keep a, a peak based on what's happening and uh, what, 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 what you've decided, what your state is. Um, so if you do this uh, on a harmonic sound, you get a set of sinusoidal tracks coming out. And so far we haven't made any assumptions about harmonicity, right? The uh, frequencies of the individual tracks could be anything. It's just we're just looking for peaks in the, sign in the spectrogram and pulling them out. But very often, you do expect them to be harmonically related. And then it's like, well, how, uh, you know, if, 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 I, if I give you a set of sinusoidal tracks and I say, oh, and by the way, I think they come from a harmonic sound, what is the, what is the pitch of this thing? You could just take the fundamental and say, well, the, they've, got to, they've got to match this one. Um, but that's sort of not really using all the information that's available to you. So this is actually a, a re the, the sinusoidal tracks for a real sound. It's a clarinet sound. And then over here, what I did is I took each of these tracks, but I divided them by the harmonic numbers, which are sort of you know, judged by eye or whatever. But I can see that they do, they, they look like they should belong to a set of harmonics. And then plotted them. And so this is like the, the implicit implied fundamental of this frequency if we assume that it's the 
the kth harmonic of the fundamental. And it's quite interesting because what we see is that they pretty much all line up except for the blue one, which is the fundamental, which is a little bit sharp. And so this is probably um, means that actually the estimation of this fundamental, the, the, the frequency estimation was a little bit biased, perhaps because it was stronger than the rest or somehow just, or perhaps because it was close to the low frequency. There's often some rumble at low frequency and maybe shifting it slightly. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know. Something, something happened here such that all the harmonics gave a fairly consistent frequency estimate except for the lowest one. So I'm tending, I mean, I'm, I'm inclined to trust this one more as the actual fundamental because we don't expect the sound to be strongly in harmonic, although that's also possible, right? You know, with some of these effects, it might be that the lowest, fun, lowest frequency, lowest mode has a slightly different effective period. But then you can see also these high, higher harmonics are a bit noisy just because they're lower energy. And so then you can imagine trying to take some kind of combined average, some weighted average of the different harmonics to get the best estimate of the total fundamental for that note. Yeah? Yeah, right. So, uh, I mean, everything I'm describing is very kind of uh, ad hoc, right? That it's like, well, okay, we've got this practical problem. We want to be able to represent this sound instead of sinusoids. And, uh, you know, there's no... We don't have a nice, uh, simple abstract principle where we can say, well, this is the set of sign size that it belongs to. Because we're sort of saying, well, we think it's sort of periodic, but it's not completely stationary. And we think it's going to have a certain amount of energy, but there's no hard threshold. So this is all you know, based on a lot of thresholds. And uh, there's, no, there's no easy way to get around that. But that. Absolutely. Yeah, so I mean, it, that's an interesting idea that um, you could take something, if I go back to that picture of the spectrum, you could take something like this and you could try and ex express this spectrum not just as a sinusoid, but as a sinusoid plus some level of background noise. And then if you actually did the best job of saying, well, I'm going to you know, have one sinusoid and then some broadband noise, uh, if you fit that, then you immediately get an estimate of what the signal to noise ratio is because you can look at the relative energy of those. And you can, um, so even if you, you know, so you're sort of fitting the, 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 the gaps as well as the, the peaks. And that can give you a, a, another way to decide whether, how much you trust the parameters you're getting out of that particular sinusoidal peak. Is this what yeah. you get in the sample code of the project? I don't remember. Oh, that, in, in the mini project, I was just taking these things, right? Just taking the local, the large, the, the, the points that were larger than either of their neighbors. So, but I wasn't doing any kind of thresholding, I don't think. Oh, and I had a hard threshold. It was like it was like a flat threshold that everything had to be. Okay, I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, something like this. But then I'm not doing the process of extracting the parameters. Um, well, so how do I find the, if I give you a set of frequencies, yeah. and I, I say I think the harmonics of a single, a single frequency, it's like, well, how do I figure out what that is? Because you can't always assume that you've got the fundamental. So you look, for a, you look for a frequency such that all of these frequencies are some integer multiple of that frequency, or close to that. If they were exactly that, then that would be the greatest common factor. Um, but, you know, there's going to be errors in each of these, so you, have, you can't use a simple approach, but, uh, but you can sort of look, for, you have some kind of uh, cost where you want, the, you want them to be relatively low harmonics of the relatively low multiples, but you want them all to be relatively close. Yeah. So you're saying the lowest is not always going to be a fundamental? Right. Right. But yeah, 
Okay, hang on. Let, uh, let me show you an example of that. Was there another question? Or? Yeah. yeah. Right. Yes. Maybe I think it is a good implementation if we can use this intuition. Like we just calculate the probability and the frequency that the signal signal um, to noise will yeah. appear and then you know uh, try to try to make the estimation of the uh, of yeah. the next down track. Yeah. So that that's a very nice approach to these kinds of problems to formulate what you're trying to do as a probability distribution. Like you say, okay, I've got something and I don't expect it to be exactly where it is, but exactly where I expect it, but I, you know, I think it's going to sort of fall within this distribution. And then you can um, talk about evaluating the likelihood of a particular set of parameters, and that's a good way to, you know, and that's like a single scale that you can compare different things. Building that model about what you think the probability of certain observations is going to be, that's, then, it, then that's where the problem becomes, because there's no, there's no single answer to that but uh, at, least you, at least you're clear on what you're trying to do. So let me just show you this, this question about the fundamental. That here's this sound, um, it's the, the high E, and that's all the tracks, but if we, um, this, is the, this, this is the fundamental, which we heard before. Now if we take um, everything else, how do I do that, Let's invert selection. So now it's all these tracks, but not the fundamental, right? If I add in. Oops. So the difference between the, the sound with and without the fundamental, this difference in quality, it sounds sort of more hollow, more hollow or more, more tinny without the fundamental, but it's the same note. The note doesn't change. And so this sound that we're hearing here has basically these, these higher harmonics, but it doesn't have a fundamental. So if I just looked at the frequencies and took the lowest note, I would actually get this. This would be the lowest frequency, you know, ignoring the low energy ones. But, that, but, but then this, this is like 2F0 here. This is 3F0, which is not a multiple of this fundamental, so that the, the note, we, you know, we'd have to do some, something more complicated. So the, the sound without a fundamental is still carries the pitch perfectly well for a human listener. And, you know, if you've got some kind of low pass or, sorry, high pass filtering going on, they can exist in the real world. And so we need a more complicated way to choose the pitch. If I took out all the odd harmonics, let's see what that sounds like. Now we'd end up with a sound where actually all the remaining harmonics were multiples of this, of this lowest one. And uh, if it works right, we might actually sound here a note that's, that's different. But I don't know how many of these I'm going to have to take out. Oh yeah, look at that. Right, so now, now it sounds an octave higher, right? When I took out those extra, when I took out all the odd harmonics, it was like, okay, that lowest frequency now does sound like the fundamental. <coughs> but you have to, you have to be. Uh, there's some, there's some threshold there where it changes. Right. That that was. So if you take out all the odd harmonics, then you then you sounds like something an, an octave above. Let's just, let's just get through the end of the slides and we'll play with this some more. Um, okay, so that's basically how we can take um, a sound and we can pull out a set of parameters to represent, represent these sets of tracks, the things that's being plotted in Sphere. <coughs> We've then, of course, got the problem of how we regenerate a sound, which is also what Sphere is doing right there. So we've got a set of amplitudes, AKNs and WKNs, frequencies or fr phase derivatives for each harmonic k as a function of time. And then to generate a new sound, we, just, we can just take these and feed them into our original you know, our synthesis model, where this parameter then describes a cosine with that particular frequency with that particular amplitude. So we can take one track 
and turn it back into a time waveform. Um, and you can, well, obviously we need these for every value of n. We've been sort of talking about analyzing on frames, so we only have it for every 10 milliseconds. Here we have, it, have to have it for every whatever, 44,000th of a second, but we can just interpolate them, right, because we think they're relatively smoothly changing. It will be faster to do this by actually taking our individual peaks. You know, now we've represented that DFT frame as a set of those individual peaks. We could reconstruct the entire DFT frame by maybe filling in the adjacent values by, on the basis of interpolating our analysis frame and doing the IDFT, and then uh, just overlap adding. Um, this is actually, you know, a nice and, and clever and very efficient way of doing it, but um, it's much it's much less flexible. We can't just individually change a frequency to get what we want out in that case. So it depends if you're interested in efficiency or flexibility. Um, so that takes us to the idea that we can not only use this to, re to reconstruct the sound that was the same as what we started with or possibly a part of that sound by pulling out individual harmonics, but we've got this description of the sound in terms of these individual frequency and magnitude points at particular times, and we can actually start moving them around. We could stretch them out in time to make the sound last longer. In a spectrogram, that's hard to do, because if you just replicate frames, you're going to get problems with the phases not lining up. But now we've just got these values of frequency and magnitude. We can just keep on running a sinusoid at that frequency, at that magnitude, at any rate that we like. And so it's much easier to just uh, change the duration. By the same token, we can also change them in frequency. We can take our set of frequencies, we can multiply them all by some factor, and suddenly the frequency will shift up, in, uh, shift, shift around, so the pitch will, the effective pitch will change, even while keeping the, the time structure the same. So, uh, and you can do that very nicely in, in Spear. Um, so here's our note, and then down here we have these controls, so I can, um, I can change the overall duration of the, the, sort of the rate at which it evolves. So that's slowed down, and now it sounds like it's, you know, unnaturally long sustain here, and also there was this funny kind of, uh, you know, the, the, the onset now has been put into slow motion. And of course we can also change the pitch. So we can take this and or we can even change it in real time, I think. So you can do this retuning. And of course, you know, if I take it down an octave here, it still sounds pretty natural. You know, to get that with the waveform, we could have just slowed down the waveform and played at half the speed, but then it would have the onset would have been blurred out, and the duration would have been too long. Here, the pitch has been changed, but, sorry? Right, well, it's not, it wasn't a piano sound to begin with, but it was a, it's a guitar sound, right? <laughs> but, it, so it doesn't, it doesn't sound exactly like a, that string on a guitar because, because it's, it's got the, duration of the, of, the, of the high E, which has less damping. But it's still, you know, it, it gives you a way to, to manipulate. And you can, you know, you can change both these things, right? So you can make the duration much shorter. Oh, much longer or much shorter over here. And now it sounds like a different instrument because it's got a much more rapid decay. And so you can have, yeah, you can have these interesting uh, manipulations of the, of the instrument, of, of the sound because you've got this parametric domain. That's, this is, that's the real payoff of um, sinusoidal modeling, that it's just, it's essentially trivial to do these modifications because um, you know, you're dealing with a very explicit description of the sounds that you're, trying, that you're representing. You're literally talking about the, the frequencies and the magnitudes of each of the sinusoids, so it's very easy to, to get them out. Um, so sinusoids are great for representing the uh, the periodic component of these sounds, or strongly, you know, of sinusoidal components in the sound. But there's not all energy uh, fits that. 
And so if you have a real sound like this blue spectrum here, we can try and pick out these strong, clear sinusoids here, and we can fit those with you know, these individual sinusoidal components. If, and then if we do that, including matching the phase, you know, I mentioned the phase interpolation, we end up with a signal which is very, very close to the, so the green is actually the resynthesis based on just these sinusoidal components for this particular frame. And you see during these uh, peaks, it matches dead on with the original signal. But in, in between the, uh, the peaks, there's some energy which wasn't modeled. And so now we see a difference between blue, the original spectrum, and green, the resynthesized spectrum. These ripples here are coming from the side lobes of the, of the, of the, of the analysis window, of the hand, hand window used here. But if we take the difference between these two, we can get this red spectrum here, which is the residual energy. So we're now we're modeling the entire signal X of N as a set of these sinusoids, a sort of relatively sparse set of sinusoids representing the big peaks and then some residual, which we can get simply by generating this and then subtracting it away from the original signal. And then that, this signal, if we, if we did the sinusoid tracking right, this signal should be fairly noisy. It should have no real um, tonal components in it, but it will have some energy, and the energy may be important to the perception of the sound. And if we, can, we can model it various ways. One of the ways that's been used is to sort of fit an LPC model, which is a way of modeling the smooth spectrum, and then just using it as, treating it as, as filtered white noise. So here's an example. Um, I have some MATLAB tools which try and do this online. So here's an example. Here's the original guitar sound. And here's the, the result of taking the sinusoids and then resynthesizing the sinusoids. It sounds pretty good. You can, when you look at it in the spectrogram of this resynthesis, you can see what's going on in a sort of interesting way, that there are these gaps here, and this is where the, the sinusoid, the track forming, has said, you know what, I think this energy has disappeared. I guess it's, it's this gap here, right? There's actually, again, because of some beating between harmonics, this, uh, the energy of this particular harmonic becomes very low here, and so the the code just says, you know what, forget about it, I'm going to end this. But then later on it builds up again, so over here it says, hmm, there's some energy at this frequency and I'm not tracking it, so I really need, need to reintroduce it, but it's kind of late in re reintroducing it, so you get these abrupt changes in the harmonics, which is typical. And so this is the residual that you get when you take this sinusoidal reconstruction and subtract it out. And you can hear, here's that little bit of that harmonic that got left behind. But if we listen to this, And if you could hear that, but it sort of it sounds kind of like this misstruck string. But let's uh, hear, hear all three again. The original, sinusoidal, and that's the residual. And sort of it's like this kind of like crunch of noise, which is sort of the uh, the non-harmonic. A lot of it is the non-harmonic pieces that come from when you hit the string. You know, this kind of noise transient thing. And so that can be a nice thing to separate out and to, to manipulate separately. Okay, so that's pretty much um, what I wanted to say in the slides here. Now, just in the last few minutes, is there any, any questions about that? Yeah. yeah. Uh, last semester in uh, yeah. ESQ, the initial time for a transport, uh, you told us that the energy in each frequency this, this, for this lecture, this, that you use sinusoid, sinusoid to uh, simulate this energy. That's yeah. But so in one sense, the, the Fourier transform, you know, not in a, in a very real sense, the Fourier transform is literally just representing, you know, a set of, a frame of values, that, that say the DFT, representing a frame of values as the sums are different of, of the set of discrete sinusoids summed to different things. That's what it's saying. It's saying X of N is the sum of you know, big X of K, E to the J, E to the W sub N to the K or something, where W sub N is a little complex exponential. So you can view that as a, a weighted sum of sinusoids, but the sinusoids are on a discrete grid. They're, these, they're the center frequencies of the, of the DFT bins. 
Here, we're almost doing that, but we're not quite doing that. Firstly, we're saying, well, we're not interested in all the sinusoids. We're hoping we can, rather than having like 256 sinusoids, we're hoping we can do a good job representing the signal with just maybe 8 or 10 or something like that. And secondly, we're not requiring those sinusoids to be exactly on the grid. That is, to be the sinusoids that complete an, an integral num integer, number of sample, integer number of cycles in the analysis window. We're saying, well, no, they can be, we're going to estimate the frequency of each of these sinusoids, and it can be any value. Right, because we're doing that, that would be the interpolation. If the interpolation found that the value of the sinusoid was exactly on one of the sample points, then we'd have one of the Fourier bases. But normally we find it slightly away from one of the sample points, and so it's a frequency that wasn't actually in the, the DFT set, you know, the, the set of omega sub n to the kn's that we use, the, uh, w sub n. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, it's a subtle point, but it's sort of, you know, it's, it's worth mentioning. So, for this week's practical, um, I want to, we're going we're gonna to play around with um, some sinusoidal synthesis. But we're going to do it in pure data because it's so great. And so what I have here is a patch. Now, what you can, t what it does is you, in, in Spear, you can take your sinusoids like this, and you can uh, you can um, filter them to remove. I guess that was a little bit too much, but you can you know you can filter them down so they only have a few left. And this is with the uh, thing messed up here. <coughs> so actually, that's not bad. And then um, you can clean these up a bit more to remove these low energy ones. And then you can export and uh, um, you save it to this file, save it to a text file. It has a, well, I guess it doesn't have that many different options. It has one option, a text file. And um, if you look at what that file is, uh, wait, where'd it go? There we go. What it, this, is, this, this is the uh, output file from, uh, from Spear, and all it does is it um, has a sort of header here, and then it has um, a set of each line, each line is now a track. Each line is a time frame. The first column is the actual time. No, wait, that's not the first column. The first column is the time, so it's like 0, 10 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds. And then it tells you the number of harmonics there are. I mean, you don't have to know this. I'm just showing it for interest. Um, something else. <laughs> and it tells you the frequency and the magnitude of each harmonic. Okay, that's that's what's that's basically information here. So now, what we can do in pure data is we can um, read in the sound file. So I've written this thing here, which is a patch that reads in the the Spear data file. So you click here, it gives you this um, dialog, and you can read in the Spear file like this. Select it. It reads it and tells you how many partials there were total and how many frames there were. And then um, you can actually resynthesize now inside pure data. Let's see if this is going to work. And there's our sound again. And what it's doing is it's got a bunch of individual sinusoidal oscillators here. And there are these patches called my partial, but it has 30, 32 instances of this. And what this does, it when you in each of the instances, it, you give it the number of the harmonic that it wants to read. It looks in this table, which was, um, which was set up. It's an array that was set up when we read this, the Spear file in. Based on which uh, harmonic you want, it looks in a certain po point in the table, so it gets the appropriate one for that harmonic. But then it just reads in the frequency and the magnitude. Uh, it takes the frequency, it interpolates it using line, and then passes it to an oscillator. And it takes the magnitude, 
interpolates that and then multiplies the output of the oscillator by that. And then this thing is basically, it, it has an output which it sends to a common bus, sort of it, it magically transports the value to an output where it gets summed up. And then just for um, the purposes of figuring out what's going on, it also displays the, the current frequency and the current magnitude on this partial. Because the problem is we get all these partials out, but now um, they're kind of in a random order. They're actually in the order of when they started. So it's hard to pick them. But what we can do now is we can, um, we can turn off all, we can individually turn on and off these oscillators. And so now we can look for the ones that have the low frequencies, which are going to be like the fundamentals. And then we can add in some of these to get these partial things. And then, then we can also do the thing we were saying where we can scale the frequencies, the time bases. These things send messages to all the um, partials to scale their frequencies. So now if I... And we can do the same thing for the time base. That We can make the time base longer or shorter. And so we can, we can produce modified sinusoids based on that. So there's a few um, novel aspects to the, the PD that we're using here. We're using you know, these uh, send things to send a message to a lot of individual instances. We're using multiple instances of the same patch with a creation argument which comes out as this, um, this dollar one is the number that I pass as the first argument, which allows me to make each of these instances behave differently. And uh, we're using this throw to, to, uh, to send these things to a common bus. But hopefully there's, you can still figure this stuff out and we'll be able to play with this and try doing some modifications with this on Wednesday. Any, any questions? All right, great. We'll see you all on Wednesday to, to work it out. <laughs>